Communist forces surrounding the city of Hue in South Vietnam's northern sector appear to be regrouping for a major assault on the ancient imperial capital. With the situation tense but quiet there, the new government commander today was reported taking energetic steps to bolster the city's defenses. Most of the fighting centered in the central highlands around the Chu Pao mountain pass near Con Tum, as South Vietnamese airborne troops battled communist soldiers occupying Highway 14, the main link between Con Tum and Pleiku. The Saigon government claims at least 75 communists killed, with government losses so far placed at one dead. While the returning veterans deal with social and emotional fallout, many of them develop health issues stemming from Agent Orange. Sprayed until 1972, it was common for soldiers to get misted with Agent Orange in the Army's defoliation of Viet Cong cover and crops. If you know anything about Vietnam, it was divided up into four areas, and Saigon was known as Four Corps, where we were up in Da Nang, that was known as I Corps for the Roman numeral one. We had some spraying towards the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but nothing like they did in the south. Um, but even so, the, the word was getting out that there could be something wrong with the water. Basically, they used Agent Orange to kill the foliage around the rivers so that the Viet Cong couldn't attack the Navy boats that went up the tributaries. But they also used it out in the field. And when the soldiers came in, you have to remember the nurses cut off their uniforms and their uniforms would be saturated with Agent Orange. So the nurses were exposed to it just like the men, maybe in a different manner but we were exposed to it also. But at that time, nobody knew that Agent Orange was dangerous. And the men will tell you that they'd be out in the field and they, they would be sprayed, literally sprayed, and their uniforms would be saturated with it, but they were told there was no problem, so. Many, like Mary Walker, developed health issues ranging from various types of cancer, asthma, rashes, leukemia, to birth defects in children. These veterans will face a legal battle in coming years, with the first class action lawsuit beginning in 1979 on behalf of 2.4 million veterans. June 12, 1973. With the servicemen and women back on America's shores, President Nixon is faced with keeping South Vietnam protected but without a military presence. His intent is to watchdog North Vietnam, hoping they have learned from the costly and punitive Christmas bombing. Particularly in view of the fact that we've told them that I'll make a personal assurance and that by God, if they don't do it, uh, the Congress is going to cut off their water. That's right. That's right. That appeals to them more than anything else, I think. Oh, I'm sure it does. And they're, they're just, they can't be under any illusions on, on either of those points. 1973 sees the apparent end of the war in Vietnam, but the start of one in Israel, which causes oil and gasoline prices to soar. The inflation will not only affect America, but the rest of the world, including struggling South Vietnam. Later that June, the passing of the Case Church Amendment by the U.S. Congress forbids the president from taking any military action in Laos Cambodia, or Vietnam without prior congressional approval. This veto-proof legislation is approved two to one in both the House and the Senate. The ban includes bombing, which ceases on August 14, 1973. On November 7, 1973, Congress passes the War Powers Resolution, which requires the President to gain Congress's approval before sending troops abroad within a full 90 days. President Nixon's hands are tied. These new restrictions on his powers will give North Vietnam the opportunity to operate without fear of American reprisal. But Nixon now has a political war to fight on Capitol Hill, some of it of his own making. If the many allegations made to this day are true, then the burglars who broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate were in effect breaking into the home of every citizen of the United States. 
And if these allegations proved to be true, what they were seeking to steal was not the jewels, money, or other property of American citizens, but something much more valuable, their most precious heritage, the right to vote in a free election. Watergate is coming back to haunt President Nixon. On February 7th, 1973, the Senate establishes a committee to investigate the break-in and possible cover-up. The televised hearings begin on May 17th. When it comes out that the president's office features a new system to tape record everything, the tapes are subpoenaed. Nixon refuses, claiming his position as president gives him the authority of withholding them as evidence. That July, the U.S. Senate Armed Forces Committee begins hearings on the secret 1969 bombings of Cambodia, which testimony reveals totaled nearly 3,500 raids. Many congressmen are displeased with the president's apparent abuse of power. Vice President Spiro Agnew, known for being outspoken against anti-war protesters and other critics of the right, is himself under fire. Accused of accepting bribes and of tax evasion, starting from his days as a governor of Maryland, Agnew resigns in disgrace. He pleads no contest, but is still fined $10,000 and given three years probation. Who has been unwavering in his support of the policies that brought peace with honor for America and Vietnam and in support of a policy that was a strong national defense for this country, which is so essential if we are to have peace in the world. And above all, he is a man who, with the responsibilities of the great office that I hold, should fall upon him, as has been the case with eight vice presidents in our history, we could all say the leadership of America is in good hands. House Minority Leader Gerald R. Ford is sworn in as vice president, replacing Agnew on December 6th, 1973. I promise my fellow citizens only this, to uphold the Constitution, to do what is right as God gives me to see the right, and within the limited powers and duties of the Vice Presidency, to do the very best that I can for America. Ford is in for more than he bargained for. Meanwhile, Nixon still tries to impede the Watergate investigations, but eventually surrenders some, but not all, of the requested tapes. By July of 1974, Nixon is ordered to turn over the rest of the tapes as his continued refusal leads to talk of an impeachment. He has no choice but to turn in the remainder and is implicated beyond the shadow of a doubt. On August 9, 1974, Richard Milhouse Nixon resigns as 37th President of the United States. Vice President Ford, in his office for less than a year, is sworn in as the 38th President of the United States. He will be the sixth successive president to grapple with the war in Vietnam. the first of many. I am acutely aware that you have not elected me as your president by your ballots. So I ask you to confirm me as your president with your prayers. And I hope that such prayers will also be the first of many. If you have not chosen me by secret ballot, Neither have I gained office by any secret promises. I have not campaigned either for the presidency or the vice presidency. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.